Yeah, we're having we're having a day and it's not even doing like the full resolution it should be doing. So it's awesome. Well, let, let me roll the countdown video to buy us yeah. a minute. Let's let's buy us a minute. Let's do that. Hello and welcome to another edition of Anti-Siphon's Address-Based Layout Randomization. My name is John Strand and I'm joined by Ryan, who is still not on an airplane. Um, we're happy he didn't blow away. Um, so yes. I don't know if you've noticed, Ryan, but I'm trying to redo the old studio in Spearfish. It looks very familiar. It does, but the lighting's all messed up and I tried to throw all of this stuff uh, uh, together. The camera is a crappy little camera. Yeah, it was a truly intense minute. Uh, to try to make sure that we get everything up and running. But um, I don't know, we're gonna get there. So we're gonna get the better lights, get everything set back the way it was. It was all just kind of thrown in the corner. Uh, but I'm gonna be coming from this studio, the one in Sturgis, and then of course the one at my house. So we've got lots of options of what we can do. But today we're gonna get straight to the tech. I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna go into ADHD. So hopefully you all can see my screen. I see now. it coming in, breaking it up. That now. is awesome. That shows that something is working, which I think is just absolutely fantabulous. All right, so what we wanna to do today is we wanna play around kind of keeping with the theme of what we did yesterday, where we were doing memory analysis with volatility. I kind of wanna roll with that theme and talk about incident response and some of the tools that are open source that are amazing um, that you can actually utilize in the middle of a horrible, horrible incident. Now, just for the record, we're gonna be doing Velociraptor today. Um, once again, this is full step-by-step -step instruction. So if you like what you see on the video, you wanna sit down, you wanna play with it, you wanna do the instructions, we have all of those here. Um, specifically, it's an intro to SOC in the Velociraptor section is what we're going to be doing. Um, also, if you're curious on where to get the VM, you can look up uh, John Strand anti siphon like that, uh, anti siphon virtual machine, like so. And this gives you full step-by-step -step instructions on how to download the VM that I'm working with right now. Because I know with a lot of videos, it's very, very common. Um, it's very, very common for people uh, to do things and really you don't know how the hell that thing that they did actually works. Um, it's good to have a VM that you can actually utilize. Uh, but let's go ahead and let's just follow the directions and talk about why Velociraptor is important and how Velociraptor can actually be utilized in your organization or for you at home, which you might be doing as well. Now, Velociraptor, if we actually go to their website, <clears throat> Velocidex, Velocidex, Velocidex um, it has all kinds of wonderful documentation. It's by the same people that brought us a wonderful memory analysis tool called Recall a number of years ago and uh, kind of builds on that entire theme of what you can do with it. Now, if you're looking at Velociraptor and you're thinking it's going to be like a full EDR, it's not. If you're looking at it as a really cool incident response tool, it is. Um, if you want to be able to query and contact multiple different computer systems in your environment, uh, very quickly. It works great for that. More importantly, though, if you're trying to get started in the industry and you are trying to understand concepts of tools that you would utilize, like if you're using, let's say, Sentinel-1, um, you would want to get started with Sentinel-1, but Sentinel-1 is expensive. They don't exactly have a home version of Sentinel-1 and what the hell are you supposed to do to try to figure out how to use this tool? 
Um, these concepts that we cover in Velociraptor and also in tools like Waza um, are really, really transferable to commercial utilities uh, that you would utilize as well. So this is great for anybody that wants to have some really good security features in your home environment. You want to get good analysis. You want to be able to pull down and run queries on multiple different computer systems. Um, and it costs you absolutely nothing. Also, this is all brought to us to the by the courtesy of Rapid7. Um, really, whenever you're looking like uh, when you're looking at lots of big corporations that are out there, I'm a huge fan of Rapid7 and what they do for the open source community in Metasploit but also in defensive tools like Velociraptor. All right, so check it out. They also have some really good training as well um, that'll teach you how to use the tool. It goes into a lot of detail. So a lot of things for you guys to get started in actually utilizing this tool and getting it up to date. Let's get started. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is set up my environment. I'm gonna run my Windows terminal as administrator, and I'm gonna set it up in this configuration that I do constantly in every single one of my classes. Um, that I'm working with, right? So we're gonna go through, we're gonna use Velociraptor, but we need to make sure that the proper files are extracted in the right location. So following those directions, we're just gonna go to the root of C, we're gonna go into the intro labs folder, and uh, we're going to right click on the seven zip file and extract here, ha, ah, there we go. So now we have the Velociraptor um, executable, which is an application, and then also this MSI file. Now. The MSI file is kind of interesting because it'll actually create the directory structure with all of the required files um, that are needed to actually run it. So we have this particular executable, which is the server. It generates the configurations and it is also the client that can actually utilize those configurations. And I think that's one of my favorite things about Velociraptor and actually playing with it is it's incredibly lightweight. Um, with a lot of the other tools that are out there, including other open source tools that I love, like Waza, they tend to be a bit heavier, right? They want to have that full Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana stack uh, all configured and ready to rock and roll. And that's great. It doesn't work very well if I'm trying to set up a class or do a demonstration, uh, much like we're doing right here. So let's go ahead and let's get started um, moving on the, um, on the instructions here. Uh, let me go back to the Velociraptor files, go to the markdown file. There we go. So I've got it extracted. I've got my terminal up and running. So I'm feeling pretty good about where I'm at right now. Um, now I'm just going to open up a standard command prompt. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to configure the server. So I'm going to CD into intro labs, because that's where it is on this VM that you all can download and you can play with. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to generate the config for the server. So I'm just going to copy and paste the instructions, just that right out of the instructions into the terminal. We're just going to generate this wonderful little configuration. It's going to be interactive. It's going to say, what type of operating system is this deployed on? We're going to be like, ah, it's Windows. Um, what's the pack for the temp directory? Ah, Windows 10. Um, what do we have automatically provisioned certificate with let's encrypt? Eh, I'm just going to hit enter with self-signed SSL. Uh, what is the public DNS for the front end? Eh, I have no idea. I'm just going to hit enter and make that local host. What port do we want it to listen on? 8000 seems good. Uh, what do you want the GUI to run on? 8889. Enter. Look at me. I'm a full stack engineer, everybody. You could just keep hinting, hinting the enter key. Are you using Google domains um, or dynamic DNS? No. Um, what GUI username or email address to authorize? Uh, I'm just going to hit enter. Um, there we go. Uh, so we've got that set up. Now it's going to ask us for the keys. See Windows temp logs. Hit enter. Should I write this config out as a YAML? Yes. Do we want to generate the client config? Yes. That's it. So that entire configuration should really seem a lot like um, the Simpsons. Whenever Homer Simpson got the little bird thing that just, you know, was it like water and it kept on hitting yes or the any key again and again and he's like i tripled my productivity because i hit y instead of yes yeah that's how hard it is to actually get this set up and configured and working properly so that's crazy but that's all in the instructions right there now what we're going to do is we're going to add in a gui user right now the newer version of velociraptor one of the new features that they added in was the ability to actually manage roles uh, multi-tenant capability and set passwords from the GUI and the web interface, which I think is pretty good. I'm going to set the password as shh password. Bad, bad, 
Now you guys know what it sounds like when I hit password. There we go. Um, so that's it. Now I have a user. His name is root and password is password. I should have set it up as Tor. I should have set up as Tor. Now for Velociraptor to run, it needs to execute this MSI file. And what this MSI file is going to do is it's literally going to install, create the proper directories, load all the executables where they need to go, and that's it. So now Velociraptor has the full config um, and everything running. That's, yeah, that's literally how easy it is to set up a Velociraptor configuration. So if you're a small business or your IT shop for a small business, this is absolutely something that y'all want to be working with. Um, you definitely want to be in a situation where you can have something like this up and running very quickly. Um, yeah, you, you can do it. Now, the largest Velociraptor instance I have heard of is about 50,000 endpoints. I don't believe that they're all using the same Velociraptor server. I think they're probably using multiple uh, like delegated Velociraptor servers. But still, it gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, that this thing has been deployed in some environments. All right, so now we've got Velociraptor, Windows 64-bit uh, config server. We're going to say the config that we're running is the server config.yaml that we created up here. And we're just going to go ahead and run it with the front end. So we'll go ahead and paste that in there. Yes, terminal. I feel good about running random code that I'm copying and pasting. Um, so now we've got a few errors. No big deal. It's, I even say, it's you know, don't worry some red, don't panic. Um, and now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna log into the GUI. GUI, it's so GUI, it's so, it's so GUI. Paste that in there. It says it isn't private. Oh no, it's fine. We did a self-signed certificate. We fully expect this. We're gonna put in the username of root. Password is password. What's the password? I set my password to incorrect, so websites remind me what it is. Um, but I'm going to set up Velociraptor here on the right-hand side and have the instructions on the left and there. It looks just absolutely perfect. All right. Um, right now, I don't have any, um, I don't have any clients connected to it at all. Um, it's just the server up and running. There's, there's no clients whatsoever. For us to actually get the clients, we need to actually run the executable. But this time, we're going to run it um, with the client config. That was generated as well. So we're going to go ahead and open up another command prompt. We're going to CD into intro labs like so. And then we're going to start up the client Velociraptor in the version like so. Paste anyway. There we go. Creates everything. Now we're going to run the Velociraptor executable with the configura uh, configuration for the client and client mode. Like that. There we go. So now the client is up and running. Um, if we go back to the GUI over here, let me click the cart targets, um, go home. You can see that we now have a client set up and running on it. Um, so I don't have any hunts or anything at all, but I have a client connected. At least I thought I did. So let's see utilization, got it set up. Um, so now let's go ahead and do show all. There's our client. Right there. So all of your clients will get a unique ID. Um, now, in a enterprise environment, what's going to happen is you'll get that unique client ID, but you'll also get the host name. Um, and that host name is incredibly useful whenever you're doing IR. Um, but one of the things I also like to, like to see my customers do is not just have individual hosts, but also kick it up a little bit and kind of segment the network. Um, for example, if you have people in accounting, if you can put them into a group associated with that, um, that would be very helpful. If you have people that are developers, having them in as a group of developers, all of these things really, really help. Um, and really, if you're looking at computer security, um, to be honest, you never really look at an environment of 100,000 units or 150,000 units of you know, endpoints and users as a full 70, 50, or 100,000 endpoints. Um, that's just stupid. Don't do it that way. Uh, if you look at like the largest organizations in the world, like if you're looking at like the fortune, let's say 10 to 20, what they do is they break up their, their company into a variety of different silos. Now you're gonna have group policies that'll be consistent as much as you can across the entire environment, but you'll be breaking down your network logically um, by basically saying these are the roles within the company or these are the geographic locations. 
Um, so when I worked at Northrop Grumman, Northrop Grumman was a massive company, or is a massive company. But they also had offices all around the United States. And even in D.C., there was like 10, 15 Northrop Grumman offices that were all different divisions of Northrop Grumman. So they basically broke that management down into those smaller chunks in those smaller areas. And that same thing needs to apply when you're doing incident response and working with a tool like Velociraptor. Um, as cool as Velociraptor is and what we're doing here and kind of walking through the instructions to get it set up, it's also kind of important to look at it and say, well, we're going to run this and we can deploy it through group policy to just this office or just this logical group of people that we think is compromised. Because you'll have a compromise, let's say, in the office in Hoboken, you can start doing Velociraptor in Hoboken. And that makes your queries, that makes your analysis much faster uh, much easier to actually work with. So we're just doing uh, some quick things on this one individual host by itself. Um, so we're going to get some information about what this host actually is, the client ID, what is the agent version associated with this particular uh, client. So we have all of that present here, which I think is pretty cool. And what I want to do now is break this up and we're going to show you how you can run commands on this particular computer system. Um, so if we're looking at this particular computer systems, we, computer system, we can actually interact with the file system. Um, I would recommend this takes a long time for it to run, but it'll actually go through and index the file system of that remote computer system. And right now this is moving relatively quickly, um, but it does take a while. And then once it's actually synced all the files off of this computer system, um, you can actually interact with it by clicking like NTFS and you'll see C, C dollar and you'll be able to access the various files and folders on this particular computer system, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's accessing files. Let me go back here. Um, but my favorite thing is you can actually run individual commands on these computer systems. So if you have a PowerShell script that just rocks incredibly proper for you, you can run that PowerShell. Um, you can also do bash if it's a Linux system. Um, but I'm going to show you cmd.exe. So with cmd.exe, I can go IP config like that, and then I can launch it, and it executes that particular command, takes a few seconds for it to actually execute that particular command, and then it gets the results back. And if I hit the little I button, the I of Saran, um, you can actually see the result of that command on this particular computer system. Um, Do WMIC process list full launch. That'll take a little while for that to actually execute, possibly. And it will come back with all of the processes on this particular computer system. So that's really cool. So you can do this um, for individual systems, but you can also do this on groups that you've created. Um, so you can actually create specific hunts and you can create these scripts to do these specific hunts on these computer systems. So there's my WMIC process list full um, that we have here, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's just a quick way that we can run. Um, <laughs> Enter the mat says, kind of looks like a C2 framework. Yes, yes it does look a lot like a C2 framework. Um, huh, yeah. And it's super duper easy to deploy. It gives you the ability to run commands. You can execute scripts. You can... Yep, yep, could totally be malware. Um, so, but remember, we've seen lots of situations where attackers have used different command and control software that is legitimate uh, to be able to access those systems. So let's see what we got for uh, the sync. It hasn't gotten anything. We get registry. I don't think we have anything yet. So it's taking a little while on this particular computer system. Um, so there we go. So just waiting for it to refresh. But let's do a hunt, okay? So what we want to do now, yeah, that's true. Tanner brought up a great point. Uh, Carbon Black absolutely can look like a C2 framework as well. It's actually, you know, maybe maybe Black Hills Information Security for our pen tests, maybe we just need to get a license for an EDR that we can deploy easily and we can script it and we can run it in our customer's environment and just say F it. We're just going to use Sentinel-1 as our C2 framework. 
Um, it's not that expensive. We're a legitimate company. I just think it'd be really hard, Tanner. Like if we have that in the report, it's what you like. We got malware running on your system. What was that malware? Uh, it was uh, it was silence. Um, it's just, but uh, God, you're not wrong. <laughs> so, so I hate it whenever you have a good idea and it's such a bad idea at the exact same time. But we'll give it a shot, right? And Mike B pointed out, we can get 14 day free trials. So what the hell? All right, so what can we do with this? Once again, these particular skills, people are saying this looks like carbon black, this looks like Sentinel One. Yeah, it does because it does, right? So if you're trying to learn how these tools work and you wanna like learn the skills of actually doing hunts on these systems, this is great. So let's do a hunt, right? So the hunt description is, uh, I'm going to go, Tanner made me laugh. There we go. Got that, Tanner. Um, we're going to go ahead and run it. We can set up the condition. We can create labels, operating systems. We can exclude from individual systems and things like that. Um, <clears throat> Dog brought up, uh, can it help us pull forensic disk images over the network? Yes and no. Remember, with Velociraptor, we do, in fact, have the ability where we can execute pretty much any command that we want, including PowerShell. So that gives us the ability to, you know, dump the memory off of a computer system, right? And then pull it off that system and get it to us. So you totally could do that, right? But this is more like think live EDR style forensics as well. Um, so we got our description. We're gonna set the artifacts. I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna do PS tree because it's there. A uh, super simple one. Now this is the script. Now, what's really, really cool about this is Velociraptor has great documentation on how you can create your own scripts, right? So you can do individual like requests or dump all the processes off of this computer system, right? That's pretty cool. Uh, what are some other ones that you've got here? Um, <clears throat> uh, Windows, you can, what do we got? Uh, you can look for evidence of Bloodhound execution. That's great. Uh, pull down Firefox history, um, IIS logs, Megasync, um, chocolatey packages, Chrome cookies, etc. Okay, screw it. It really does look like a C2 framework. Like, like Tanner made that joke, like, crap. We can even pull down macros on the system. So I guess welcome to the video, Velociraptor is a C2 framework. Um, and it's probably better than a lot of the commercial C2 frameworks that are out there. And by the way, I'm not... I'm not ripping on you, Brute Rattel. I'm not making fun of the people at Nighthawk. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, um, just a little good natured ribbing. All right. So we've got parent process IDs. We've got prefetch information, impersonation, uh, process memory. We can actually like run full Yara against the system, which is great if you have a threat intel feed on that particular system as well. So there's a lot that you can actually do um, with Velociraptor for these various hunts that you can run on these consistent on these individual systems. Um, for configuration parameters, I got nothing specific resources. You can set how long it's going to take. You can slow it down. Now, if you're looking at like the ops per second, yeah, if you're running this on a normal like network and you're running at like 10 gig on the, like your local LAN, um, yeah, you can just let this thing scream. If you're running this over a VPN, um, uh, yeah, you might want to slow it down just a hair. So you can make it a little bit nicer on the network as well. And that's one of the, like, the classic rookie mistakes that you see for anybody that does incident response is they set it up and then they pull information from computers and then they just like just smoke the entire network completely. And I'm just going to let you know, if you're in the middle of a live incident and you bring a network down while you're doing forensics on that live incident, that's a bad day. Yeah, ask me how I know. Um, all right. So we can review what is the re what is the actual script that we're going to do in the description, and we launch it. Um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to set this particular one up. Let's execute it. Do we want to run this hunt? Run it. There we go. Now it's executing. Uh, Mike B said that's called containment on this system. Uh, so what you're saying is Velociraptor could be a, a kind of a thought of as a potential LOL bin. Yeah, it absolutely could be a potential LOL bin out there. So we've got the curvy little hourglass, the saucy little state hourglass hue. Um, you're doing IR, Mr. President. Um, but we're waiting for that to finish out. And when it's done, you're going to actually see um, the download results show up over here. 
um, where you'll be able to pull those out. So I'm waiting for it, waiting by the phone, waiting for you to call me up and tell me I was done. Um, just right here is where it is. I can't think. Um, there, see, it's finished. All right. So let's go. There it is right there. Yeah, now I can hit summary.zip. Extract that zip. Do, 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 do. And we're going to pull down all generic system, uh, PSTree.csv. I'm going to open it up in WordPad because I don't have any like good spreadsheet things. And there you go. There's all the processes on this computer system, which I think is pretty neat. Now, once again, why exactly would somebody want to play with something like Velociraptor? Why would you do this? Well, the main reason why you would do this is, um, one, it's free. And honestly, you can't beat the price. I mean, looking at the cost of this entire thing, it's it's nothing. I mean, that's why I use it in my Intro to SOC Core Skills class, because it is very accessible. People can use it. And you can actually get a lot of power out of it. Um, once again, I've got a number of customers that are actually utilizing this. They're creating run books. They're doing all these different things. And that's great. And usually something like this, you're, you're looking at, you know, if AV fails or the attackers have somehow bypassed um, antivirus, it really gives you an opportunity to kind of dig deeper. And like what we talked about yesterday with memory analysis or in the, the previous video, um, or if you're doing live forensics, this is just another tool. But this tool allows you to do this instead of a scalpel and doing analysis on individual computer systems. This is a tool that gives you the capability to run this on multiple computer systems simultaneously. And that is incredibly powerful. So if you know how to work this, you set it up in a lab, you can play with it, you can set up specific hunts, set up specific scenarios. Now you go into an interview and you're trying to get a position in your, in your own company, or you're trying to get in a position in another company that is out there, well, now you have experience with these types of things. Um, so that's just really, really super cool uh, for you to play with. So, um, so go ahead and check it out. So I wanted to throw it over for questions for anybody. Um, it looks more feature rich than Defender Advanced Threat Hunting. Um, I would, okay, so let's talk about the pedigree, right? So if you look at the pedigree of uh, Velociraptor, um, we had Google Recall. So here we go. Now, this is the, the Recall framework. Um, and one of the main developers of Recall actually left and then started up Velociraptor, um, switched over and started Velo uh, Velocidec. So if you're looking at that pedigree, I mean, the people that created this tool are real IR people. And some of the people associated with it, in addition to, addition to recall, they also worked on Google Rapid Response. Weird keyboard. It's like, it's like from the 80s. There we go. Or grr, right? So this is the Google Rapid Response framework, which also... Um, is a little bit more up to date than uh, the recall framework out there. So once again, I mean, if you're looking at the pedigree, these people came from Google and they have like really good solid memory analysis. They basically forked the volatility project a number of years ago. There was a beef between volatility and other people. So they basically said, fork it. We're going to come up with our own framework. And actually I used recall. Um, I used recall all the time um, in my class up until the point um, that it just was no longer supported anymore. Uh, but that's the pedigree, right? So these are people that do incident response. And also, as I mentioned, it is supported by Rapid7. And um, Rapid7, of course, has an IR team. So you really have a lot of people behind this particular product uh, just doing a great job in, uh, in, in basically setting this up for the community, which I think is good. Um, now, this is different than Waza. I'm gonna do a different video on Waza, and I don't want it to become a turf war between um, Velociraptor and Waza. Waza is amazing. Um, and it also has some antivirus type things that you can throw into the mix as well, which I think is great. But it's for me, for what I'm doing with my classes, it's a lot heavier. Um, so it doesn't quite work so well.
on that particular scenario. Uh, so that is Velociraptor. Now, um, next week, just so you know, and if you have any questions about this, please do me a favor and just type it in chat. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. But next week, we have Wild West Hacking Fest. And that means we're still going to be doing the news. We're still going to be doing these things. Um, but it's probably going to be on the stage with a whole bunch of people. I might get Corey and Ralph to come in studio in here with me because I think that that will be a lot of fun out there as well. Do memory forensics tools work natively in Velociraptor or we use live shell functionality to deploy, dump, and retrieve memory? Um, so two different ways of looking at that, Doc Ford. One of the ways to look at that is running the live forensics commands and then getting those results off of that computer system, which I think is a solid way to live your life, right? Um, so that's one way that you can actually do it. The other way that you can look at that is you can actually utilize, if you have PowerShell, you have command prompt access. You can use these tools to download uh, memory dumping utilities um, and then running scripts that'll actually allow you to dump memory off of that computer system and then pull that memory back. But there are some advantages and disadvantages to that, right? Um, one, it's easy. You can script it, you can run it. That's great. Downside of that is we actually see techniques out there like shadow walker style techniques. And like a shadow walker style technique is basically where an attacker can um, look for sequential memory reads and then they can page their, uh, they can actually page their malware out of memory and uh, basically make it a lot more difficult to uh, detect that as well. Uh, so that's, like I said, that is shadow walker. It's not... It's not something we've ever seen in any like actual incidents out there anytime recently, um, but it is something that is possible. It was actually Jamie Butler demonstrated that technique back in uh, 2008 at Black Hat, actually. So my point in that long kind of historical thing of like, look, there's a tool that bypasses these things um, is... If you're trying to pull the memory off the system when the malware is actually running on the computer system, you run the risk of basically an attacker being able to hide from that memory dumping utility. If you're able to do a snapshot of that particular computer system, if it's running in a virtualized environment, um, then it's a lot better. But we don't have best, right? So I think looking at the range of options that you have becomes incredibly important. So if you're looking at this tool, number one, it's quick and easy to deploy. Two, you can run the commands across multiple different systems. Three, I don't see a lot of attackers hiding from something like Velociraptor. So that means it has a lot of advantages. And if we get wrapped up on like some advanced nation state attack or may do some shadow walking style techniques, well, then we're kind of missing the point. Um, and we're kind of creating this sort of like unicorn hacker in our head. And we're trying to get around that scenario. So shoot for center mass. And if you're looking at like Velociraptor, you're looking at dumping memory off of computer systems and doing analysis, excellent center mass tool. Uh, do you have any examples of how that if this can be used remotely, i.e. run the EX key, dump a file and import it into Velociraptor? Um, no, all the stuff that Velociraptor is doing is pulling from those systems real time and then pulling it down to the local system um, on its local database. So it's going to store all of that. Um, so yeah, you can actually run these commands, queue them up, pull all the results back, and then do analysis on them um, offline. You absolutely can do that. But as far as like pulling a memory dump and then doing analysis on that memory dump, um, no, Velociraptor is not going to have that particular capability yet. But hey, that's something, you know, they worked on recall and recall had a GUI, so maybe it's going to be possible out there as well. Push Kansa and run those PS files. Um, so Kansa... Um, is an excellent tool um, that was created by Dave Hull. God, you're really making me stretch on this one. Uh, so Dave Hull created this tool called Kansa. It's actually an iteration of a tool he created called Malsang. And if you look at Sang, it's like fishing with a net. And Kansa allows you to execute uh, commands on multiple different computer systems, and then allows you to do statistical deviation analysis on those systems. So the point of that would be, we can pull the process execution on every system. Every system is going to have, you know, Microsoft Word or Outlook running, but only one of those computer systems has TrustMe.exe. So tools like Kansa can be used to actually identify that deviation, that outlier that exists. Um, now, Dave Hull was working at, God, where did he move to? Um, I can't remember when he was, where he was working. Uh, I met him in, I think, it, uh, like an Ions event in Toronto. Uh, we went out for lunch. Uh, Dave is, 
but like done stuff with Sans Institute. We go way back. Uh, but Kansa is a really, really cool tool. And honestly, if you're looking at the concepts associated with Kansa, um, and I can actually bring that up here. Tanium, that's where he's at. That's right. Um, actually, he might not be at Tanium anymore. He might have moved on. So he's got a GitHub repository right here. I mean, I don't think Kansa has been updated for a while, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, but it basically allows you to run these commands across multiple different computer systems and then pull the results back. Uh, so absolutely fantastic tool. And my point on all of this is, like, this is absolutely something that would be cool in, uh, this would be something that would be really, really, really super cool in, uh, in uh, something like Velociraptor. Um, that would be really cool to do the analysis at scale and look for the outliers. What are the network connections? What are the domains? What are the processes that exist in a handful of systems? Because that would make that type of analysis a lot easier. And ironically enough, um, I think Tanium started putting in a little bit more of some plays. Can't remember if that's something Orion wanted to do, trying to get more into the security space. And uh, that is something that, you know, hopefully we'll get that running in um, Tanium at some point in the future. Uh, but no, check out Kansa, absolutely wicked cool tool. It's an iteration, next iteration of a tool that he originally wrote called Malsang, um, which is neat. All right. All right. So any other questions, folks? So again, I hope you guys are all enjoying, or you folks are all enjoying these small, dense, technical things. And I know right now I'm going through my labs. I do this just because they're available. And once I get through my labs, next up is Backdoors and Breaches cards. Um, I'm thinking about the next video next week. I don't know how you all feel about, um, um, I don't know how you all feel about possibly like SQL map. Does that sound cool? Um, oh, by the way, if the LinkedIn user could give us a link to Arthur, um, that would be really, really cool because um, I'm always looking for those tools. And that's actually how I learn most of what I learn about out there. See, so attack, remote, threat hunting, incident response, malware, archaeology. Let's go ahead and look at that. That's actually pretty cool. All right, so maybe this will be another stream. Maybe we can do something on Arthur. So, all right, uh, I'm here to get better open source because I've been way too spoiled yeah, on commercial stuff. But remember, anytime you're working with a commercial tool, you're not paying for what that commercial tool does. You're paying for what that commercial tool does that the open source tools do not. And you're gonna find out that really, the vast majority of the uh, commercial tools are out there. They do pretty much with the open source tools, but they have a beautiful GUI. Uh, written in Israel, usually it just looks so amazing. You just want to look at mm, tasty cookies, right? So with that, I want to say thank you so much. Um, kind of like I said, we're kind of getting some extra studios set up. We are have multiple studios for class recordings, and we're going to have some special guests in studio next week for Wild West Hacking Fest. By the way, um, we gave you a link. The host gave you all a link. WildWestHackingFest.com forward slash Deadwood. You can still get your tickets for the virtual events out there. So all right. Thank you so much, everybody. I'll see you next week.